Bon venuto tutti. Welcome to the Norwegian Institute in Rome and welcome to the, um, I don't know what number of uh, Lourang lectures this is, but welcome to the annual Lourang lecture. Um, first of all, there's a practical issue. I am uh, required to announce that this evening's lecture will be video streamed and if anyone doesn't approve of being part of a video stream, even though it mainly is Jonathan who will be uh, in the in the link, then the, I'm afraid you're going to have to leave. <laughs> uh, you're warned. The Norwegian Institute uh, aspires towards being an international meeting place between re researchers from Italy, Norway, Scandinavia, and the international community. And in our approach to research and teaching, we emphasize research. Um, and teaching across disciplinary boundaries and seek to uh, extend uh, or participate in a broad academic discourse. And although the Institute's mandate is expanded in geographic and academic terms, basically everything Italian, uh, and not limited to Rome or Italy, not limited to classical archaeology and not limited to art history or uh, ancient history, I recognize, and I'm a prehistorian, uh, particular responsibility towards these areas, disciplines, and also the discourse uh, of integrating these into a wider academic discourse. And the Lorraine uh, lecture uh, should always have uh, ties to the, institute's found, the institutional founder's uh, academic interest. Um, this program program for the Institute uh, arose when I was planning the first Lurong lecture, which is the first that I'm responsible for, and the, the lectures for the years to come. Uh, the speaker should preferably be, be able, also be able to address an audience outside a narrow field of specialists, using specific cases to approach issues of broader contemporary mythological, interpretive and theoretical concern and significance. So I asked my colleague and also uh, Søren Holmbeck, who's a classical archaeologist, if he had any suggestions, suggestions. And he immediately suggested Jonathan Hall, mentioning that he worked with the relationship between sources and different kinds of sources, that he looked upon questions concerning the recently, concerning the rise of Rome. And he said something like, he's in, in, interested in the same kind of stuff you are. Uh, and about the same time, I attended a, uh, an event over at the American Academy with Ian Hodder and, and uh, uh, Andrea Carandini, the latter who used a significant amount of his time to address Mary Beard over a dispute concerning the structures his team had uncovered at the foot of the Palatine Hill, which I think might be something that you'll be talking about a little bit today. No. <laughs> then, then I can quote from your book. These things... Some people think that academic studies and academic issues are a bit dry and dusty. But in this dispute, Andrea, Andrea Carandini, and I take this from uh, uh, Jonathan Hall's book, uh, in defense of his position said, the coincidence between the monuments that we have, this, is a, this concerns the founding, uh, the founding level, what he thinks is the founding level of Rome. Um, the coincidence between the monument that we have brought to light and that which is described by the literary, literary source is, for a person of Western culture, quite natural, not to say inescapable. Only a masochist, a pervert, or a hypocrite could fail to see it. Now that's the sort of academic arguments that uh, I'm not very familiar with, but really brings up the temperature. I got that quote from a book that I read that uh, Jonathan wrote called Artifact and Artifice, Classical Archaeology and the Ancient Historian from 2014. And this is a sales pitch because that is an absolutely fantastic book. And I think after today's lecture, uh, a lot of you should read it. And one of the things that I think that particularly younger scholars here should emulate is a completely jargon pre clear and coherent language and argument. So I'm very happy that today's speaker is Jonathan Hall, who quickly uh, committed to lecturing here now. And uh, his, his lecture, The Archaeology of the Individual in the Ancient Mediterranean World. Um, 
the um, he you based on the summary beforehand we'll be visiting uh, Augustus's house on the Palatine there's maybe the con controversies about Tung Tu at Regina and perhaps uh, Amphipolis and he will be exploring issues of power agency and personhood <coughs> The meeting between history and archaeology, the meeting between structure and history, between agents and structures is something that I'm deeply concerned about, not the least in the wake of the third science revolution in archaeology that allows us to actually study people. But as opposed to the people that Jonathan can talk about, we don't have names. They're, they don't have names, but we actually study individuals now. It says something about the potential of multidisciplinary approaches to scholarship. Jonathan Hall has focused on the culture and social history of ancient Greek. That's his initial area of interest. In later years, he's also looked at broader issues like Rome or the hist historiographical uh, studies of cultural heritage and the young Greek nation state. He's received rewards for, of for awards for excellence in teaching and not visiting the American, us or the American Academy. He's the Phyllis Hay Horton Distinguished Server, Service Professor in the Humanities and Professor in the Department of History and Classics at the University of Chicago. He's also uh, written extensively articles and books, and his recent books include the Artifact and Artifice book that I mentioned, A History of the Archaic Greek World, Hell Hellenicity Between Ethnicity and Culture. So again, on behalf of the Norwegian Institute, I'm very happy that Jonathan Hall could join us today and present this year's Lorong Lecture. So Jonathan, please. Thank you very much for that um, warm introduction um, and it's a very great honour and privilege for me to be invited to deliver uh, this lecture uh, in honour of Professor Hans-Peter Laurent. Um, Dr. Prescott mentioned, even plugged, um, my most recent book, Artifact and Artifice. And in fact, my lecture today uh, is really an extended thought uh, that I only mentioned in passing in the conclusion uh, to that book. A lot of the case studies that it's going to be considering have already been featured in the book, but of course this being archaeology, scholarship moves on. There's been a lot published even since 2014, and I'll try, try to take account of some of that. Well, I want to begin this evening's lecture with the astonishing events surrounding the investigation of Castor Hill, near the ancient city of Amphipolis in northern Greece. Already in 1964, a stretch of the wall that encircles the hill had been exposed. More than 50 years later, in 2012, renewed excavations revealed that the circumference of the wall, which was constructed from Thasian marble, was 497 meters, and that it probably dated to the last quarter of the fourth century. Furthermore, cuttings on the summit of the hill were tentatively interpreted as having supported the famous statue of a lion whose fragmentary remains were discovered in the last century on the banks of the river Strymon. Speculation quickly arose that the Castor Hill was the largest funerary tumulus ever discovered in Greece. And already in February 2013, the director of the excavation was suggesting that the tomb might be that of a personage connected to Alexander the Great, perhaps his Bactrian wife, Roxana, or his posthumous son, Alexander IV. In the summer of 2014, the excavators uncovered the painted facade of a tomb whose door was surmounted by opposed sphinxes. The first chamber was connected to a second by an entrance framed by two larger-than-life caryatids. ...the tomb unplundered. And in addition to fabulous grave goods, contains the cremated remains of a man in the main chamber and a woman in the antechamber. Almost immediately, and with strong encouragement from official authorities, Andronikos declared that the male occupant of tomb two was Philip II, the father of Alexander the Great. 
Just as quickly, however, this identification was challenged by those who believed that Tomb 2 must post-date 336 BCE, the year of Philip's assassination, and that the cremated remains inside were more likely to be those of Philip III Aridaeus, the half-brother of Alexander, and of his wife Eurydice. That, at times bitter, dispute has continued unabated over the last four decades, and David Grant's In Search of the Lost Testament of Alexander the Great, published earlier this year, is unlikely to be the last word on the subject. As Yanis Hamalakis and Dimitris Plantsos have pointed out, the examples of both Castor and Vergina are enmeshed within a highly sensitive political discourse concerning contested claims over the territory and even the name of Macedonia and the fundamental Hellenicity of its ancient occupants. But the public appetite for unearthing famous individuals from the past is hardly limited to Greece. One thinks of the location of the presumed remains of King Richard III in 2012 under the Leicester City Council car park and his reinterment three years later in the city's cathedral. Here in Rome, the cases that immediately spring to mind are the supposed burial of the Apostle Peter in the Vatican, beneath the basilica that bears his name, or Pope Benedict XVI's announcement in 2009 that the remains in a sarcophagus beneath the high altar of San Paolo Fuori le Mure were those of St. Paul. The dispute concerning the identification of the Caratoni house on the Palatine Hill as the residence of the future Emperor Augustus may have been conducted less publicly, but considerable media attention was devoted to Professor Andrea Carandini's claims to have uncovered material indications of Romulus's activities. Perhaps it is the illusory familiarity of famous individuals that makes them appeal so much to the popular imagination. Yet there is, among many archaeologists today, a thinly veiled contempt for the study of individuals in history. Julian Thomas has even argued that to impose the concept of the individual on the distant past is a dangerous and potentially narcissistic exercise. The reasons for this antipathy to the individual are largely connected to the intellectual trajectories that the fields of history and archaeology have pursued in recent decades. To take history first, the doctrine of what we would now call methodological individualism had already come under attack in the middle decades of the 19th century from the sort of historical materialism associated with the name of Marx. It was eroded further with the focus on social and economic history that characterized the Annal School in France, and especially the second generation of Annalist. In the Anglophone world, while the rise of social history in the 1960s and 70s initially seemed to offer the prospect of rescuing the subaltern voice from oblivion, its commitments to structural constraints and social forces dodged questions such as agency and experience. True, the ripples from these currents of thought were slow to reach ancient historians and they were never pervasive. But there can be little doubt that the social and economic approaches to the past that were fostered by Moses Finley left an indelible mark on the field. As Finley put it, if one believes it to be a misjudgment of social behavior to seek the mainsprings in the personalities and decisions of political and military elites, then the alternative analyses and explanations of some contemporary historians represent progress. Many archaeological theorists had already been privileging social groups over individuals, but for different reasons. The realization that the material traces of the past were sparse, partial, and incomplete encouraged practitioners to work on a larger scale, observing recurrent regularities across large swathes of time and space. 
One thinks, for example, of Gordon Child's definition of an archaeological culture as, quote, a plurality of well-defined diagnostic types that are repeatedly and exclusively associated with one another, unquote. Such a conception of the archaeological record left little room for individual agency. But just at the very moment when many historians were turning to social approaches, a new wave of archaeological theory, dubbed processualism in the United Kingdom and new archaeology in the United States, rejected historicizing approaches to the past and aligned itself with the social sciences, whose concentration on collectives rather than individuals can probably be traced back to Durkheim. Drawing on approaches from cultural ecology, new archaeologists tended to view cultures as passive and adaptive responses to the environment, which generated predictable and normative patterns of human behavior with little scope for individual agency. Even in the more idealist models of culture that were proposed by critical theorists such as Claude Lévi-Strauss, Jacques Lacan or Michel Foucault, human subjects are typically held hostage to symbolic structures of signification or the operations of power. In the 80s and 90s, the so-called post-processual school of archaeology reacted against the doctrines of new archaeology by turning back to history, championing the practice of contextual analysis, and arguing for the restoration of agency to archaeological interpretations. Yet, as John Barrett has argued, quote, a concern with agency neither marks a return to the individual in history, nor a return to methodological individualism, unquote. First, by appealing to Anthony Giddens' theory of structuration, or Pierre Bourdieu's notion of the habitus, many archaeological theorists argue that agency is mediated by practice, which is both constrained by and generative of material and symbolic structures. Second, the recent turn to notions of materiality, be it Igor Kopitov's cultural biography of things, or Bruno Latour's actor network theory, might suggest that not all agents need be human. In fact, a lingering mistrust of the individual remains in much of the writings of archaeological theorists. The critique that I cited earlier by Julian Thomas derives from his contention that the concept of the individual, seen as a rational, autonomous and knowledgeable agent, is a post-Cartesian creation of Western modernity and that its imposition on the past is both anachronistic and ethnocentric. In a similar vein, Michael Shanks and Christopher Tilley have written that the free, autonomous subject going around conferring meaning and significance at will is also an ideological component of capitalist social relations. Bernard Knapp and Peter Van Dommelen have taken exception to this complete occlusion of the individual in archaeology. Following Lynn Meskel, they argue that the terms individual and individualism should not be confused, while the latter, which involves concepts of selfhood, may indeed be the product of a very specific historical context, archaeologists have employed the concept of the individual more widely to indicate, for example, the objects of physical anthropological analysis, the creators of works of art and craft products, and those personages represented iconographically or textually, as well as historically known individuals such as Sumerian kings or Egyptian villagers. In response, Thomas has maintained that a Sumerian king cannot be assumed to be an individual, quote, simply because he had a specific name and a particular body, unquote. <clears throat> It is no secret that the majority of contributions to archaeological theory have been made by students of Mesoamerican archaeology and European prehistory, who barely ever mention classical archaeology. The omission is significant 
because the thing that distinguishes the archaeology of the Greek, Roman, Near Eastern and Egyptian worlds from other archaeological fields is the existence of contemporary textual documentation. Something that should be a cause for celebration among classical archaeologists rather than a source of embarrassment as inexplicably often seems to be the case. Almudena Hernando has, uh, has suggested that the transition from pre- or proto-historical relational identities to modern individualized identities is connected to the distinction between oral and literate societies. But even if the strict dichotomy between orality and literacy were valid, which it is not, the literate cultures of the ancient Mediterranean upset so tidy a schema. The written word gives life to a multitude of individuals, not only ethically in the case of catalogues of third party actors, but also emically in the individuals who submitted petitions in Hellenistic and Roman Egypt, the sculptors and vase paintings who signed their products, or the countless men, women, children, resident aliens, freedmen, sometimes even slaves who are commemorated on their tombstones. We can, I think, agree that the modern Western or neoliberal conception of the individual is unlikely to have existed in antiquity. If notions of personhood are produced and performed through broader networks of relationships, then they will vary according to historical context. But to dismiss any perception of individuality on the part of ancient actors is surely too cavalier and is hardly rendered true just because nobody has survived to refute it. Take Frasicleia, famously commemorated by a marble chorus statue dating to the middle of the 6th century and found at Merenda in Attica. The words ascribed to her on her base, I shall always be called maiden, having been allotted by the gods this name instead of marriage, are clearly those of the family members who commissioned the monument. But they also indicate that such a personal internalization of one's fate was at least thinkable. Sarah Brown Ferrario has recently argued that the origins of what we might call great man theory can already be traced in the histories of Herodotus in the 5th century. Even Thucydides, whose preference for materialist explanations is announced early on in his work, concedes that individuals can make a difference, especially in his account of the Sicilian expedition of 415 to 413 BCE. Ferrario suggests that a sense of individualism progressed yet further in the 4th century and especially in the age of Alexander. And that, perhaps, offers at least one plausible explanation for the development of portraiture in Greek art. Now, of course, the case studies with which I opened this lecture concerned not just any individuals, but celebrities, which probably explains why they continue to be the subject of public fascination. The obvious objection to the quest for ancient celebrities is that it is a return to great man theory, supposedly compromised not only by the theoretical objections to methodological individualism that I've been outlining, but also by the inevitable sexist and elitist connotations involved in such an inquiry. Put bluntly, the venture could be deemed politically incorrect. Yet, if the textualized environment of ancient Mediterranean cultures offers a prospect of a rehabilitation of the individual in archaeology, there really is no logical reason why celebrities should be excluded. The role of archaeology is not only to substitute for the lacunae in the literary record, but also to offer a parallel, alternative, and sometimes even contradictory discourse to the concerns of authors for whom, like it or not, prominent individuals were a worthy subject of discussion. That, however, is easier said than done. In fact, the material traces of ancient celebrities are remarkably elusive. 
An obvious explanation would be that since famous individuals constituted such a small subset of ancient populations, it would be unreasonable to expect to find them in an archaeological record that is itself a minute sample of past activity. But that is not entirely satisfactory because it assumes, erroneously, that individuals of differing statuses are likely to be represented archaeologically on an equal or comparable basis. The Carian dynast Mausolus invested considerable resources into the design of his tomb, and it is not by accident that we can identify its foundations today. In a world where conceptions of the afterlife were at best vague and at worst pessimistic, the permanent marking of the, uh, the, permanent marking of the landscape was one of the few guarantees of an existence beyond the tomb. Augustus, who almost certainly took the mausoleum of Halicarnassus as the model for his own funerary monument, made doubly sure of his legacy when he appended to his mausoleum the text of the Reis Gestae. Again, it is not by chance that we are able to identify the mausoleum of Hadrian or the tomb of Lucius Munatius Plancus on Mount Orlando above Gaeta. At Vergina, on the other hand, we are confronted by a stubborn anonymity. Attempts to identify the deceased in tomb two have been based on analysis of the tomb's architecture, its contents, and the cremated remains found inside. It has been argued that the barrel vault technique, the costly golden grave goods, and the depiction of a multiple quarry hunt on the frieze above the entrance of the tomb cannot predate Alexander's conquest of the East. That, however, would be to make the unwarranted assumption that there was no culture contact between Macedonia and the East before 330 BCE. No absolute consensus has been reached on the chronology of the grave goods, though there is a growing opinion that the latest artifacts, for instance these four salt cellars here, may be too late for Philip II's burial in 336 BCE and might therefore accord more with Cassander's reburial of Aridaeus and Eurydice 20 years later. Faced with this impasse, a number of scholars have tried to make arguments based on what is claimed to be scientific analysis of the cremated remains. But here there are two problems. First, of the four analyses conducted on the remains since they were unearthed in 1977, no two converge in their conclusions. Second, it is virtually impossible for the non-specialist to adjudicate between these conflicting scientific interpretations. The first analysis of the remains concluded that they were of a man aged 35 to 55 and a woman aged 20 to 25, but they were unable to find any evidence of the wounds to the eye, clavicle and thigh that Philip II is said by literary sources to have suffered. At about the same time, however, Jonathan Musgrave claims to identify a notch in the supraorbital margin of the male skeleton and a fracture along the malar maxillary suture, which he believed to be consistent with an eye wound. The gruesome wax model of the male skull that Musgrave and the anatomist Richard Neve constructed became famous, I'm sure you've seen it before, but is now largely discredited in part because it showed traumas that cannot possibly be determined by skeletal remains alone, but mainly because it involved so much guesswork and imaginative reconstruction. In 2000, Adonis Batsiokas again claimed that he could find no evidence for wounds, dismissing the supposed trauma to the right eye orbit as pathological and attributing apparent facial asymmetries to warping during the cremation process and reassembly of the skeletal material when it was deposited in the gold larnax. But he also argued that the bones indicated a dry cremation, which would mean that they were unfleshed at the time they were cremated. 
This would, of course, fit better the circumstances of Aridaeus's funeral, conducted some time after his murder by Olympias in 317 BCE. In response, Musgrave and his team redefended the case for a wet cremation, though they were forced to admit that this did not necessarily exclude Aridaeus, since, and I quote, Aridaeus's body would still have had putrefying skin and muscle attached to his limb bones and rotting viscera filling his thoracic, abdominal and pelvic cavities after even 17 months in the ground, unquote. I hope I haven't put you off your dinner. <laughs> the remains have now been subjected to a fourth analysis whose preliminary results were published online in 2015. Examination of the remains in the main chamber indicates a male of 45 plus or minus 4 years, around 160 centimetres in height, whose skeleton had been fleshed at the time of cremation. Specific evidence of the wounds that are supposed to have afflicted Philip II, save for an incision on the fourth metacarpal, were not forthcoming although the team argued that indications for sinusitis might be the consequence of a facial wound, while signs of pleuritis might be the effect of bodily trauma. The team also noted Schmall's nodes on the lower thoracic vertebrae and marked muscle insertion sites on the long bones, which might suggest a life spent on horseback. Jolene McLeod has argued that this should probably rule out Aridaeus, who is described in the sources as, quote, afflicted by an incurable mental condition, another quote, slow-minded, or another quote, epileptic, unless, of course, this is all part of a deliberately negative source tradition. Now, while identification of the male remains in tomb two has largely oscillated between Philip II and Aridaeus, a variety of candidates has been suggested for the female cremation in the antechamber. Andronikos originally proposed Cleopatra, Philip II's seventh and last wife, who was murdered along with her infant daughter on Olympias's orders shortly after Philip's assassination. For those instead who preferred to identify the male occupant as Aridaeus, the female remains are those of his wife, and step-niece Eurydice. Nicholas Hammond, who favoured Philip II, pointed to three features of the antechamber that he considered significant for the identification of the female. First of all, the absence of any infant burial, which he thought should exclude Cleopatra. Second, the presence of weapons, including a goritus, or quiver, uh, whose closest parallels come from Scythia, and thirdly the fact that the female remains seem to have been interred in the antechamber almost immediately after the male remains. Hammond wondered whether this last observation indicated that the female had either committed suicide or was sacrificed on the occasion of Philip's cremation, a ritual known among the Gatons and the Scythians. In this case, the female might be either the Thracian Maida, Philip's sixth wife, or the unnamed daughter of the Scythian king Atheus, who is said to have planned to adopt Philip. The official line taken by the Archaeological Museum at Vergina is that the female occupant of the antechamber is Maida. But Theodoros Antikas, who directed the most recent osteoarchaeological study of the remains, favours the daughter of Atheus. First, a pubis fragment that was apparently not examined by previous researchers gives an age for the female of 30 to 34, which would exclude both Cleopatra and Eurydice. Second, evidence for horse riding from an early age, together with the Goritos, would point to a Scythian rather than Thracian princess. In addition, Antikas and his team discovered that there was a compressed fracture on the left tibia, which might account for the mismatched pair of gilded greaves found in the antechamber, another indication of female martial prowess 
for which the Scythians were famous. The problem is that this interpretation ultimately depends upon an anonymous wife or consort of Philip II that is mentioned by no source. And even if Atheus' adoption of Philip II was intended to be sealed by a marriage, for which there is no evidence, Justin makes it clear that the adoption offer was eventually retracted. It never went ahead. Ultimately, as MacLeod points out, the physical anthropological analyses of the cremated remains in Tomb Tomb have been vitiated by prior assumptions about the identity of the deceased. What is needed is a blind examination by an international team of experts. This aporia is obviously created by the lack of any epigraphic testimony. This is not due to a specifically Macedonian epigraphic habit because names are attested on numerous 4th and 3rd century funerary stele from the area of Vergina. Perhaps an epitaph did originally commemorate the occupants of Tomb 2 and is now lost. More likely, there was no need to advertise to passers-by the identity of those interred within. This was, after all, an impressive funerary monument in a location, Igei, that had ceased to serve as the Macedonian royal capital towards the end of the 5th century and was now only used as a ritual centre and burial ground for the Macedonian monarchs. The funerary mounds, of which you see a partial imitation here with the construction of the new museum, the funerary mounds that covered Tomb II physically perpetuated the kleos or fame of its occupants. Nor is it likely that this kleos was extinguished when all three tombs were buried beneath a 12 meter high tumulus in the third century, perhaps at the initiative of either Lysimachus or Antigonus Gonatus. As David Grant has pointed out, tumuli do not hide a tomb's presence, in fact, they broadcast it. But if the intention behind the larger tumulus was to prevent the looting of the tombs underneath, as Andronicus originally proposed, then it was clearly successful in the case of tombs two and three, although not tomb one. And indeed, this may explain why the large tumulus is not in fact centered on any of the tombs. This is something that has troubled me for a long time. Over time, however, the memory did fade, perhaps an inevitability in a part of the world which, which was subject to so many resettlements, forced population movements, and migrations throughout history. A built grave constitutes a physical and potentially permanent marking of the landscape. By contrast, the living leave a far more ephemeral footprint in the archaeological record. In 1978, the American School of Classical Studies at Athens published a picture book entitled Socrates in the Agora, which aimed to, quote, look to find him in the material world and physical surroundings of his favorite stamping ground, unquote. Yet, aside from well-known public buildings such as the Stoa of Zeus Eleutherios or the Stoa Basileos, Socrates' footsteps proved to be very elusive indeed. One building that has attracted attention is a courtyard house just outside the southwest corner of the Athenian Agora. On the basis of what have been interpreted as the accoutrements of shoemaking, as well as the recovery of a kylic space inscribed with the name of a certain Simon, Dorothy Thompson claims to have located the workshop of Simon the Cobbler, with whom Socrates is supposed to have held many discussions. The identification is not impossible, but some caution is warranted. First, although Xenophon does refer to Socrates' visits to a saddler's shop, Simon is not named as the philosopher's interlocutor until the time of Plutarch and was evidently promoted by the cynics who regarded him as Socrates' true heir. Second, the identification of short iron nails 
and bone rings as hobnails for boots and eyelets for laces may depend more on modern shoemaking techniques than anything we know about ancient Greek footwear. Third, the Kylix base with the name of Simon inscribed on it, a name, it should be said, that is not uncommon in Attica, was found outside the house in the street and cannot, on archaeological grounds, be associated unambiguously with the house. Even more phantomatic is the so-called Poros building, a corridor structure southwest of the Agora, which Eugene Vanderpool proposed to identify as the state prison in which Socrates had been executed in 399 BCE. Indeed, the building continues to be identified as the state prison on site, even though the designation has now been dropped from the most recent edition of John Camp's guide to the Athenian Agora. Vanderpool's identification was based on location, the plan of the building, and the objects that were found inside, all of which are far from persuasive. In terms of location, the only thing we are told about the prison in which Socrates spent his last days is that it was near the law court. Vanderpool argued that the Porus building was situated about 100 metres away from a rectangular enclosure that had been tentatively identified as the Heliaia Law Court, but which is more likely, in fact, to be a sanctuary of the hero Iacos. As for the building's plan, Vanderpool's penitentiary, with its square cells, exercise yard, and guard tower, owes more to Jeremy Bentham's designs for the Panopticon than to anything we know about ancient Greek prisons, which is next to nothing. Finally, the 13 small vessels, which Vanderpool conjectured were medicine pots for hemlock, were found in a third century context. The porous building is more likely to have served some sort of industrial or commercial function, and may even have housed a marble working establishment at the time of Socrates' death. When, uh, in Artifact and Artifice, I originally considered the spectral presence of Socrates in the Athenian Agora, I suggested that Athenian democratic ideology might have constrained the material displays of wealthy elites, who were expected to at least feign conformity to an egalitarianism that might leave little mark in the archaeological record. After all, important Athenian statesmen such as Cimon Pericles and Cleon are similarly absent from the archaeological record. But the fact of the matter is that famous individuals are elusive in all Greek states, whether or not they were democracies. The so-called tomb of Leonidas, which was shown to 19th century visitors to Sparta, was almost certainly not the resting place of the ill-fated Spartan king. For my last two examples, I turn to Rome. From 1956, Gianfilippo, uh, Gianfilippo Caratoni excavated on the western part of the Palatine Hill a structure that comprised a peristyle court surrounded by rooms decorated with wall paintings in the second style. On the eastern side of the courtyard was a ramp, which Caratoni believed gave direct access to the terrace on which was built what is generally believed to be the temple of Palatine Apollo. Since Phileas Paterculus, Suetonius and Cassius Dio all inform us that the temple was built on property belonging to the young Octavian, Caratoni reasoned that the house he had excavated was that of the future Emperor Augustus. Those findings were, however, challenged by renewed excavations at the beginning of this century by Irene Jacopi and Giovanna Tedone, who concluded, firstly, that the Caratoni house was part of a much larger structure, which included two symmetrical peristyles. Secondly, that the ramp did not give access to the temple terrace. And thirdly, that the entire complex was unfinished at the time it was buried to make way for the Sanctuary of Apollo, perhaps after the Battle of Actium in 31 BCE. 
Building on this reconstruction, Andreas Carandini and Daniela Bruni have argued that in around 39 BCE, the young Octavian originally decided to build for himself a palace that, with a surface area of around 8,600 square metres, was fit for a Hellenistic despot. As Octavian reinvented himself, eventually adopting the name Augustus in 27, the ambitious building plans were abandoned and the incomplete palace was replaced by the Temple of Apollo. Like Jacopi and Tedone, Carandini and Bruni believe that Augustus constructed for himself a new house to the west of the temple, of which uh, only part of a tufa peristyle remains today. But they also imagine a second symmetrical complex uh, to the east of the temple, for which there are virtually no concrete indications. Just as with tomb two at Vegina, the problem is that we have no in situ epigraphic evidence to indicate the owner of the house. Worse still, Suetonius informs us that Augustus spent the last 40 years of his life in a modest house he had acquired from Hortensius, which, quote, was conspicuous neither for space nor for refinement, since it had short porticos with columns of auburn stone and rooms without any marble or special paving. This is evidently at odds with the Caratoni house, let alone um, Carandini's Hellenistic palace, and Carandini has sought to address the contradiction by dismissing Suetonius's testimony out of hand. I cautiously attempted to salvage Suetonius's reputation by conjecturing that he may have been misled by insincere professions of simplicity in Augustus's own correspondence. Peter Wiseman, on the other hand, insists on taking Suetonius seriously. By drawing on the writings of late Republican and early Imperial authors, he reconstructs a late Republican ideological conflict in which the populares attacked a small group of aristocratic optimates for their arrogance and luxurious lifestyle, including the vast mansions in which they lived. Octavian, who came to prominence as a champion of the people, would only have been following his principles in demolishing the sprawling palatial property of an anonymous grandee to make way for a sanctuary dedicated to Apollo. At Vergina and on the Palatine, we have physical remains without names. In the Vatican, by contrast, we have a name without physical remains. When the Emperor Constantine built the predecessor to the current Basilica of St. Peter, he expended a great deal of effort and expense in ensuring that the high altar should stand over a niched structure known as the Idicula, which dates to the middle of the second century and originally stood in an open courtyard belonging to a necropolis. On the wall of the nearby tomb of the Valerii, someone, perhaps a labourer working on the Constantinian Basilica, had scratched a graffito in appallingly ungrammatical Latin, asking Peter to pray to Christ for the holy Christian men buried near his body. There are good reasons then to suppose that Constantine believed the Idicula to mark the grave of the Apostle Peter, and that this monument was what the early 3rd century cleric Gaius had described as the tropion of Peter, though what exactly Gaius meant by tropion has been disputed. Furthermore, another graffito that seems to refer to Peter was scratched onto the so-called red wall against which the Idicula was built, and probably dates to the 3rd century, which is when it was obscured by the construction of a buttressing wall, wall G here, on which Margarita Guarducci claimed to detect a palimpsest of graffiti with encrypted references to the Apostle. Yet the Idicula did not mark a grave. Beneath it was a simple pit, in which the jumbled remains of a woman in her 70s, two men in their 50s, a cockerel, a pig, and a horse had been unceremoniously shoved beneath the red wall. 
Well, Ducci maintained that the director of the excavations had secretly removed remains, human remains, from a marble-lined niche in the buttressing wall G, placing them in a lead-lined box that then lay forgotten in the Vatican storerooms for 20 years. When it resurfaced, the contents were examined and judged to be the remains of a, quote, robust man between 60 and 70 years of age. Since traces of earth found on the bones matched samples taken from the area surrounding the idicula, Guarducci concluded that these were the remains of Peter, originally buried beneath the idicula, but then transferred to the adjacent buttress perhaps to protect them from groundwater. Conversely, Antonio Ferrua, another member of the original excavation team, swore that the niche in the buttressing wall was empty. Even if he was mistaken, the chain of custody here has clearly been compromised. But even if we allow that human remains were transferred from beneath the articular to the niche in the cross wall, why assume that these were the relics of Peter? Surely Constantine would have constructed a more decorous resting place for the Prince of Apostles. Nor is this the only case concerning Peter where we have a lure de mémoire that is unassociated with human remains. In a courtyard complex beneath the church of San Sebastiano on the Via Appia, some 600 unencrypted inscriptions, many of them at least contemporary with those in the Vatican necropolis, refer to Peter and Paul, as well as to a refrigerium or funerary meal. A number of sources, including the 5th century Acts of Sebastian, the 6th century Liber Pontificalis, and the 7th century Salzburg Pilgrim's Itinerary, claim that the bodies of the two apostles were at one time buried on the Appian Way. And this may also be implied in an inscription attributed to the late 4th century Pope Damasus. Yet here too, no grave has come to light. Paradoxically, perhaps, it is almost as if the memory of the individual proves to be more resilient in the ideational realm of tradition and faith than in the material record. And it's with this point that I would like to leave you tonight. I hope to have persuaded you that the search for the individual in archaeology is not necessarily wrong-headed per se, although famous individuals, ancient celebrities, are surprisingly elusive. But perhaps we've got all this back to front. Our conventional understanding is teleological in that it assumes that a famous individual marked by wealth, status, renown, and the capacity for action should, all things being equal, leave an observable footprint in the archaeological record. In practice, however, it is we who search for the historical individual, and it is we who read back into the past our own preoccupations and etiologies. The concept of the individual may not be a creation of modernity, but the search for the historical individual is undeniably presentist. Thank you very much.